Hello and welcome to the Information Command Center. Thank you so much for joining the midday update. In studio with us is the Minister for Tourism, Information, Broadcasting, Culture and Creative Industries, the Honorable Dominic Fede, along with the Chief Environmental Officer in the Department of Health and Wellness, Mr. Parker Ragnanan. A lot has been happening since Inusha opened its borders on July 9. We did have the revision of protocols as well that will, that is guiding the reopening uh, to commercial flights to St. Lucia. There's been a lot happening on the ground in terms of preparation for the official reopening as well as some adjustments to the protocols, adjustments to how things are done on the ground to better accommodate and better facilitate how St. Lucia is handling the COVID-19 pandemic. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Thank you so much for coming in. We want to start with what have we seen at the Euronora International Airport that has been really the uh, hub of activity as we reopened our borders. In terms of numbers, do we have any uh, statistics on the number of uh, passengers that have come through at the Hironora International Airport thus far? Okay, so thank you uh, for having us on your program today. With regards to Hironora International Airport, I just want to say that um, completely new protocols have been implemented. One of the things that uh, are in place today that we've never had before is a medical facility erected at Uranora International Airport. Uh, what is the intention and the use of that facility? It's to ensure that every visitor who is coming to the country, whether you're national or foreigner, go through a process of screening. And that screening process would uh, entail a medical examination, including temperature checks, as well as persons being interviewed for uh, countries of visit, um, exposure, as well as the presentation of the negative COVID certificate test results. And it is at that facility, if there is need for swabbing of individuals to be done, whether you've been tested or not tested before, uh, swabbing may be done and uh, testing of that person. Uh, this is where it happens. The other thing that happens at uh, that new facility is really where a designation of quarantine facility is really allocated. Uh, I, I think I'd go more into that because it's important. What we are seeing is a number of our nationals are applying for home quarantine at this point in time. And we continue to advocate that home quarantine is not necessarily the best managed process uh, given the situation we have. Um, home quarantine is, is rarely for extenuating ex uh, exceptional circumstances. However, we are seeing that uh, many of our returning nationals are applying online for home quarantine. And when they have been told that it is not possible to be, to be home quarantine, there is a certain level of resistance. Uh, their thing with home quarantine is one, to ensure compliance. We've seen in the past that there is an unwillingness to comply to being quarantined at home. Uh, there are strict guidelines and protocols to deal with home quarantine. But people think that if they're at home, then they can meet with their friends, they can socialize, they can go to the supermarkets, they can go to, to, to the to town and that kind of thing, go to the beach. And that is creating a major problem. Hence the reason why in the first phase of the reopening up, um, we are not looking at home quarantine as a preferred option. Facility quarantine is really the ideal way because it allows for a controlled environment. It also allows for the better use of the medical resources that is scarce. You are able to do the daily monitoring and screening of these individuals in one setting, one physical space. Unlike when people at homes through different districts, towns, communities, that a medical personnel will have to find where you are, where you're living to physically visit you and to be able to um, screen you on a day-to-day -day basis. So that is the challenge uh, that we're having. So at the facility, um, the, the, the public health facility at the airport at HIA, the uh, designation of quarantine facility is, uh, um, is done. And that is done through a, 
a tagging system where an armband is placed on the arm and uh, there's a color coded scheme that will determine whether you're, uh, you have been designated home quarantine, facility quarantine, or hotel accommodation. And they are the uh, certified COVID hotels that are in operation at this time. So far, if we are looking at numbers in terms of the number of tests we have done, and that is for people who have come in and have not presented uh, their test results, or we have had reason to um, do a second test. So far, um, in the, for the week that we have opened the borders at HIA, we have done 22 tests. Um, what we have had is a total number of 170 persons going into home quarantine. 225 individuals are now placed in quarantine facilities and we have uh, 476 guests at the hotels throughout the island. So in the one week, because we opened uh, the borders last week, Thursday, so for the w week that has ended, uh, that is the numbers that we're looking at on the island. 170 home quarantine, 225 government facility quarantine, and 476 uh, visitors at the hotels in St. Lucia. So how are you planning on managing? Because as we are open, it means that the flights are coming in. We have a certain number of uh, uh, rooms for, that we can use in our public health quarantine facilities. So how are we planning on managing the numbers um, as we go along? Certainly, um, we recognize the challenge in terms of the space that is available at the approved government quarantine facilities. One of the things that we're doing is to stagger the numbers of, of, of locals that are coming in as best as possible. Um, so there is an online form that they, they need to fill out and so forth. And we are looking at our space uh, presently. The other thing is um, we've seen that the flights are not coming in very heavy at this time. So we have probably the largest number that came was about 140 on one flight. Um, so we've seen, we've seen less person on the flights. The other thing to, to, come, to add to that is um, today is actually the, the, the ninth day. So 14 days is going to be very soon. So the first set of people who are in quarantine would be released and would be replaced. Um, and uh, that is the way we intend yeah. to manage that. that, that so uh, if that I can situation. just um, shed some light, yeah. um, if you will, Mr. Raglanad. Um, we have a capacity of 350 mm -hmm. quarantine rooms using um, uh, five different hotels at present with Starfish being the main one in the Rodney Bay Medical Facility. And what we're trying to do is to uh, help to stagger the arrivals of the um, St. Lucia Nationals as much as we can, because um, I'm sure that the Ministry of Health would prefer to have an institutional quarantine arrangement. Mm -hmm. I'm sure the people of St. Lucia would feel safer it, knowing that everyone that come in would either be in a managed environment at a hotel facility or would be in an established quarantine. So um, we are working very hard to manage the flow of traffic, but it is becoming very, very difficult. As Mr. Ragdanan has indicated, there have been nationals who have returned without um, being tested. And we continue to work with the airlines to try to enforce that protocol because we want to have an extra level of surveillance. We do understand that as the cases go up in the United States, it is becoming rather difficult for people to find the tests. We see in the news that Americans are talking about, in some instances, a six-week wait for a test to take place. And we have, within our protocols, a one-week uh, window within which you can do the test. So it becomes rather difficult in terms of the practicality of this happening. But we have to do as much as we can to ensure that we uh, protect our people because the United States remains a very risk area. One of the things that I notice that keep coming up, people keep saying that um, we have chosen the U.S. as the only country. No, we have opened our international borders, but the U.S. at present is the country where most of the flights are coming from. Um, you would have heard that Liat is in liquidation yes. and Caribbean Airlines have not uh, started uh, service back to our country as yet, so the Caribbean market would uh, be impossible for us to resume, although there's a new carrier with a very small carrier, um, one Caribbean, which has just um, 
started operation and they've started advertising flights to come from, I think, St. Vincent, Grenada, Barbados. And uh, I think there are going to be other flights operated by Inter-Caribbean. The British flights, it is v proving very difficult in the British market for individuals to get a test to come. So it would be very, very difficult for us to get that market reactivated. And the uh, health situation, we continue to monitor it to see when will be the best time for us to um, send some kind of signal to the UK market to say, yes, we are ready to, to do it uh, without testing. At present, if we do the UK market, I believe the uh, advice coming from the Ministry of Health is to ensure that they are pre-tested as they do in the United States. Um, Canada uh, seems to have stabilized the, uh, the curve somewhat in terms of the spread of the virus. And we see that Air Canada is, uh, has advertised a flight to start in the 1st of August mm -hmm. is when we're looking to reopen that market and that becomes um, rather difficult again, but we're doing the pre-testing. We will see how it goes with the Canadian market. We have instituted a travel bubble. So those countries in the Caribbean that are very, very safe is uh, very beneficial to the yachting sector at the moment because they can come from a low risk COVID country uh, without having to quarantine and they come into the uh, various anchorage in St. Lucia. So. Um, that has been the work we've done so far in terms of reopening. For St. Lucians, the, the question foremost is why take the risk of having the United States? You explained uh, that so far the United States is the, the area where you would find the flights most easily being able to, to come in. But, uh, and you did indicate that the cases in the United States continue to rise. So why are we taking this risk by allowing our borders to, to be opened for the U.S.? Well, I think that the Ministry of Health, they have put a, a very strong set of protocols in place. When we look at the fact that you have a pre-testing, so you know that most of the people that are coming in, they're COVID negative, at least you have some kind of indication, uh, although you cannot be absolutely sure. Uh, that's one. And then when you look at the facility in Mr. Ragnanan's opening statement, he did indicate it that for the first time, our airport has a medical facility. And if you see uh, the level of detail with which they operate that facility, uh, it takes a, a pretty long time now to screen each uh, passenger. I think the first plane load took about four hours before we can clear the whole plane because uh, they are absolutely meticulous and they are taking every precaution to keep us all safe uh, in terms of making sure that even though they come with a negative test, they're screened at the airport again. They continue to be monitored at the hotel. So I think that this is a very managed uh, risk that, is, uh, that we're taking against the backdrop that we cannot stay close forever. When we look at the amount of people i have just come from my ministry and there's a long line for people signing up for the income support program. These are people who are in the informal sector. So people are finding it very difficult to live and I know that some of us uh, will find it easy to say, well, let's keep the border shut, but there are 14,000 people who are unemployed. And we're very happy to report that within the first week, we have got some 1,400 back at work. And that is really about 10% of the unemployed population because of COVID that has uh, been re-engaged in the uh, meaningful employment and we're very happy about that and I think that that's all the risk we've got children to send to school we've got bills to pay at the um, ground level at the household level and it really is difficult um, we've got an economy we've got a hotel sector that is uh, on the verge of being bankrupt uh, on the verge of, of, of collapsing and we have got to uh, st strike a balance as much as we can I think we've got to be optimistic. The Ministry of Health has done a phenomenal job in leading the Caribbean and certainly being among one of the best countries in the world in terms of how we've managed the crisis so far. And I, I really ride on their confidence and ride on their ability to be able to manage this disease. And every step of the way, we've taken their advice. Statistically, talk to us about yes, the calculated risk. Yes, yeah, so I wanted to say, 
firstly, it's, it's a very calculated approach in terms of the reopening. Um, that is why, one, we look at having certified hotels, COVID certified hotels, where the guests would go. Uh, the other thing that the number is showing is that um, there seem to be almost a 50-50 split in the number of nationals that are coming as well as visitors. So it tells me that we have quite a number of St. Lucians who were probably stuck. We have some of them who are cruise ship workers among those individuals who have returned. There have been people who, who are looking forward to, to returning to St. Lucia uh, who were not able to get flights. And we have seen in the very first instance, once the borders reopened, that a number of St. Lucians are coming back. The thing about it is, looking at uh, the, the, the safety measures that have been implemented. So we spoke about a facility at the airport on arrival where you do screening and medical assessments. We've done extensive training with the, the taxi service operators and the new measures that must be implemented. We've done extended, extended amount of training and implementation of protocols with the hotel sector. And uh, that is why not every hotel presently has the uh, certificate to operate, because you need to have certain measures in place. One of it, it includes having uh, medical people on a team, at least a nurse, available at the facility, and having systems in place to continue the monitoring um, of the guest, as well as the staff at these facilities. A requirement is that there would be daily reporting of anything that is happening to the Ministry of Health. So uh, guests are still subject to the daily temperature checks and monitoring for any symptoms of COVID symptoms, as well as the staff members. Um, and a report is submitted on a daily basis uh, to the Ministry. If anything is picked up, it has to be picked up very early and managed very early. The other thing that we are saying in St. Lucia is we can no longer operate under a premise of zero risk because there is not one country in the world where you don't have at least one case of COVID at this point in time. That is why St. Lucia has taken the, the position that uh, there are some countries that are deemed to be low risk and most of these countries are within CARICOM, other Caribbean countries. As a result, the decision has been taken, and it's my understanding, it's not just St. Lucia, but the OECS has taken that decision as to looking at uh, um, ratifying the bubble. And what we are saying is if you are coming out of these countries, you will not be subjected to having the pre-testing done as well as to be going into the 14-day quarantine. But for all other individuals who are coming from countries outside of that bubble, the pre-testing and I know it's not 100% foolproof, full, full um, but it is a, a layer that, that is in place to, to give some assurance. Then there is the, the testing that is done. Um, if there anybody is suspicious, um, on arrival, there is the testing that is done. And then there is the daily monitoring at the facilities where, where, where person live. Now they are the hotel facility, and the country has not opened up uh, what I would think irresponsibly in that, in that manner. Mm -hmm. So currently, a number of the tours, the sites and the attractions are out of bounds to the visitors that are coming in. We are saying that, yes, um, what you could do basically now is to do a sightseeing, and it's not even by land, it's by sea. So you can take a, a day boat and, and go down the coast, go to Sofra, go to Viewfort, but you're not even permitted at this particular time to come off that boat. Um, why is that so? let's so? just re-emphasize that, yeah, that so that if you were to see that some tourists are out on the water, yes. that it is permitted. It is permitted. Um, what, what we are doing now, again, is as, as, as best as possible, try to limit contact with the local population. That is what this phase is about. It's actually testing the grounds and see what is happening uh, because we want to be in a position that if we have to pull back, uh, that we can do so easily because we want to minimize exposure. That is what we're saying that um, the, the, the workers at the facilities, the hotels, um, they need to do the daily medical examination and screening because we are concerned about their health and safety as well. And so there are certain measures that are put in place in terms of the new protocols and operations. Uh, as a matter of fact, 
what we have found at, at the points of entry at Viewfort, for example, HIA, Euronor International Airport, if you come into St. Lucia and you're coming as a tourist and you are booked to a hotel that is not certified, right there at the hotel you'd be asked to change that booking. At, at, the, yes. at the airport you'd yeah. be asked to change? Uh, yes, at the airport. Okay. Uh, to get into one of the certified hotels because we want to make sure that you are on a managed environment. environment. And these are some of the measures that we've put in place. We'll, uh, talk, yes. we'll talk about the managed environment in a moment, but we on the platform I'm noticing a query about why have individuals who have tested negative or they presented a negative test remain in quarantine? Yeah. So what happens within seven days of having a test. So you do a test and you're in the US waiting for the results. Um, it takes maybe five days to get that results. People are still exposed. And it doesn't mean that because you tested negative um, on day one, that by day seven you cannot be positive. There's that possibility. Hence the reason why quarantine is the second layer of assurance that we want to have. Because what we've seen, and, and, and we saw one example of it in St. Lucia, where somebody came in with a negative test results, was placed in a, a government quarantine facility, and now has, has tested positive, positive. For, for COVID. So, so the test in itself is not foolproof. The, the, the other thing is we need to ensure that um, we can still monitor you. And some people are asking, why, for, why 14 days? Because we know the incubation period for uh, COVID-19 is 14 days and hence the reason many people are of the view that if I'm tested I should not go into quarantine and we want to dispel that notion and, 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 and to tell you that the requirement is yes you do a test but further you'd still have to go into quarantine because the test in itself is not foolproof um, and hence the reason why um, sometimes we get resistance um, especially by our locals and I'm not in any way targeting our locals, but we seem to have the, 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 the view that I'm a St. Lucian, I'm coming to St. Lucia, and I should be given certain liberties as a St. Lucian mm -hmm. to be able to go home, to enjoy my family, to enjoy my time in St. Lucia. Yeah. But at the same time, we need to have the, the precautionary measures in place, and quarantine is one of such precautionary measures that if you're coming from a country that is outside of the bubble, then you need to be subjected to the quarantine, even when you have done a test. Now, that is a situation, Minister, where um, we, with, uh, all over the world now, I'm, I'm reading of cases where individuals are finding that the protocols are um, infringing on, on, their, on their rights, the freedom of liberty to do, as you indicated, uh, Mr. Ragnar, and to do as, as they wish. For us here in St. Lucia, how are we trying to stave off that sort of uh, these happenings where I know that p people must do the signing on. It's the form of uh, a sort of um, binding, if you will, agreement between the traveler and uh, St. Lucia to abide by the protocols. You know, Lisa, um, it, this is not an easy time for any of us. It's, it's difficult. It's disrupted our lives in so many ways. Um, it's changed the way we do things. It's changed the way we live. And... Um, I think we all have to do our part to get our country through this successfully, is my simple answer to the question. Um, this continues to be fluid, it changes every day, and I believe that um, all of us need to um, pay heed to the, the advice of the medical experts. And I think if we continue to do that, I think then we'll continue to be a very safe um, destination. When I look at what's taking place in certain jurisdictions, the amount of hospital Realization that takes place and the amounts of deaths that are take that have taken place in mm -hmm. some countries I don't think that we want to get to that stage So I think that quarantine is a very small price to be paid because I believe the alternatives to that is A lot more painful for all of us to endure mm -hmm. So what we've seen and we were talking about the managed environment for our visitors and our returning nationals we have heard of instances of uh, the visitors being spotted outside of the um, certified uh, hotels. Minister, you had reason to call an emergency meeting to, to deal with, with those um, reported cases. Coming out of that meeting, what are the tangibles that we 
are going to move forward with? Um, well, first of all, I'd like to state that not all of the incidents that you've seen on social media are true, and not all of the reports are true. Um, we are aware of, um, out of uh, 476, almost 500 hotel guests, we are aware of four or five incidents where um, guests have actually left the property. And so what we need to do is to uh, disabuse ourselves from a lot of the false reports that are taking place. When you do check with hotels and check with their security and uh, look at their surveillance um, technology, we see that um, some of the reports, the time they were reported, are untrue. Mm -hmm. However, um, at the very first instance of hearing that there were one or two instances where guests have left the property, we quickly call an emergency meeting to ensure that we let the hotels know that they've got two choices. They either um, keep their guests inside or the state will have to take whatever means necessary to ensure that our residents are protected. And what we have done, Lisa, is to send a very strong signal to hotels that the health and safety of the St. Lucian people is our first priority as a government and that remains our first priority. So we continue to do that. Uh, the second thing we said is that you need to beef up security. Mm -hmm. And there's also a better communication between hotels and the local law enforcement officials. So I'm very pleased with what has taken place. And I believe that we continue to have a very uh, safe set of protocols and a very good working relationship with all stakeholders. As we uh, try to manage this and, and keep the tourism products alive at the same time, I know that, um, you know, as you mentioned, we have some postings on social media of uh, cases that are untrue. And how do you see perhaps this, this sort of action um, affecting the work that we are doing and trying to manage, our, our, manage COVID-19 as well as provide livelihoods? How do you see that affecting us? Well, it's uh, this misinformation. I think that um, there are people with agendas. And, you know, every cause, you know, if you look at the march, there were some people who were going out there and they marched uh, for causes that are real. And there are some people who use the opportunity of such a situation to loot shops. And I think it's, it, it, it's comparable. And what we have to do is to... Um, is to, is to really separate the good from the bad and to keep optimistic mm -hmm. and to ensure that we um, encourage people to um, always sound the alarm. That's always the wise thing to do because all of us have to make sure that we are watchdogs um, and that we help each other enforce the protocol. So if I go into a mini mart and the owner or the operator of that store says to me, listen, um, you need to put your mask on. I feel extremely proud and I feel extremely good. And that's an instance where I would congratulate someone like that. And I think it is very simple steps like these where all of us can play a very significant role in ensuring that we win this fight. Yeah, Mr. Ragnar, for people who may, because the ministry did ask for the cooperation of the public, because after all, the authorities and officials can't be everywhere at the same time. So in terms of that public participation and assistance um, for your department, how are you engaging? How can the public engage you? Sure, and, and, and we welcome vigilance. And, and like the minister says, persons to be watchdogs because we are all in this together as a country. Um, what we want to, to ensure is, is that we are careful how we relay information. Um, there are times we, we try to sensationalize some of the things. Um, we are very happy when we get information that we can use to conduct our investigation, um, to do our contact tracing, for example. And we want to continue to work with uh, every solution. We have uh, indeed uh, um, have the, the free one one that people can get onto and, and, and provide information. There's a platform that has been in place and continues to operate. We've also given numbers for um, the Office of the Chief Medical Officer and other officers in the Ministry of Health. Um, I'm sure there is numbers there for contacting the Ministry of Tourism. 
we want to, to, to work together with every St. Lucian. Um, what we want, though, is to ensure that uh, we are able to verify information before we can actually make pronouncements on that information. Because if information is not accurate, it can hurt us more than help us. Uh, that is one of the things we need to, to, to ensure. The other thing is, um, in epidemiology, we can, we can actually do a, a kind of case investigation and uh, we can uh, indeed uh, work with individuals, work with sectors in terms of doing our investigation. And, and that, is, that is very important because many times you, you get information um, from un, unofficial sources that you can use to, to help you to get to a point, information that you may not readily have. And these, these are important, but at the same time, like I said, we must do it responsibly and, and uh, do not try to uh, sens sensationalize a story even before we know what the facts are on it. Minister, are we getting a very um, keen reaction from the properties in order for them to be certified. I know that we have uh, quite a number of them that were certified, it'd be something like 17 accommodation properties already certified. So are we getting more interest? Well, a lot of people are just anxious to get back to business because, I mean, financially to be closed while you have certain obligations can't be easy for a number of the operators. but. It's more than the 17 hotels um, which you reference. We also have um, certified many small businesses. There are about 26 or so uh, small boats which we have certified. 500 taxi drivers are back into business because of this opening. So it, it shows you that the opening of tourism is a pretty big deal for our economy. And tourism really uh, is such a, a lifeline, a lifeblood of, of what we do in this country. And so the indirect jobs, I mean, we have not put a number to it, but I'm sure that companies that are trading with hotels, now that some of the hotels are back, would have actually rehired some of their employees as well. So it's really good to see that uh, some employment is coming back. Um, this is really, really good news. In the first week, um, being at 500 is um, an absolute success. I know that there has just been one positive case yes. that we've had in the first week. So um, I am uh, really, it's a positive sign that we're not seeing uh, too many um, cases. There's, they have swapped a number of individuals that have come through. So I think all in all, what you see is that uh, a very strong management of this uh, virus and a very calculated risk that is being taken. Um, when you listen to Mr. Ragnanan and all of the layers and the question you asked about why test me, why uh, quarantine me if I've got a negative test, but it goes to show that we are really serious about managing this and what we have put in place is more than a filter, but it, it's a strong defense against um, any likelihood or a strong possibility of there being an outbreak. One cannot be absolutely sure there's still a lot of risk involved but we are continuing to do our best to make sure that we keep the people of St. Lucia safe. How if are I, we if, if yes. I want to just add to that before you go with the next question, Lisa. Um, apart from what the Minister have expressed, um, the Ministry of Health, Ministry of Tourism, we continue to work with the smaller properties, uh, not the hotel classified properties. This would include the guest houses, the mm -hmm. Airbnbs and so forth. Because um, right now one, 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 one of the uh, fundamental principles that we're advocating is if, if persons are coming from within the bubble, they may not necessarily have to go to a, a COVID certified hotel, but they can go to the smaller properties. Um, and so we have been working with these properties in ensuring that they have the, the protocols in place as well. Um, and uh, we expect that uh, uh, they would be up for business very, very shortly as well. So it's not just one category of the accommodation sector, but slowly we are looking at the other um, entities within that accommodation sector opening up as well. And, and since we have developed that safe environment, the safe zone, we are saying that uh, to these properties, you can likely have persons from these areas come to your property 
and be able to spend their, their vacation in St. Lucia while there. I think I was going to ask the question about the monitoring of the properties to ensure adherence to the protocols and that also includes creating a safe environment for the workers. Yes. So how are we monitoring how the properties are performing on that level? Okay, so if I come in, um, one of the things that we've been able to do is partner very well with the Ministry of Tourism. And so we've been able to get additional human resources through that partnership, as well as the, 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 the government of St. Lucia have uh, um, approved a, a, a COVID response task force, or team, sorry, within the, the, the Ministry of Health. Um, that is where we've been able to get the additional human resources to put at the port facilities and additional human resources to be able to allow for monitoring. Now, um, monitoring plan has just kicked in because we only opened last week. So one of the things that was happening is that there was the joint assessment that was done with uh, health and tourism and the properties were assessed and certified. And that is the team that would continue to do the monitoring um, based on a schedule um, for these facilities. Uh, so that is, that is there's a, 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 a schedule of, of, of the monitoring plan and, and how it is effected. And uh, so far, we, we, we are seeing a fair, fair compliance with these protocols and um, we need to continue to work together with these properties that already opened as well as those there are several um, applications that we have at this time from other um, business places in the accommodation sector that they too want to open up as early as um, the first week of august and so we continue to work with these properties to ensure that they are meeting the requirements um, based on the protocols the other thing um, apart from the protocols is that Every single institution, including the Airbnbs and the guest houses, must develop their own action plan. Because whereas Ministry of Health would do some monitoring, but one of the key aspects of opening up now is to ensure that there is the self-monitoring that is happening. Uh, because we cannot be on a property 24-7. So the hotel or, or, or the accommodation sector, one of the things we've asked very specifically is to have one point person that we can contact with on a daily basis, that you are the point you are dealing with, uh, looking at the protocols, and we can call you at any time to find out what's happening in that sector, what's happening in that area, and work with that individual. So as part of their own action plan and Im implementation plan, that is one of the requirements. Self-monitoring is, is something that has to be done. And that is why earlier on, when I spoke, I said that they need to submit the daily reports, medical reports, to the Ministry of Health. If there is zero, no, you, you tested everybody, everybody's fever is good, still report. Mm -hmm. If there's elevated temperatures, report that as well. So we want the zero reports because it adds up. And so these are some of the things that are in place in terms of not just the government institution doing the monitoring, but the facilities and themselves are doing the majority of the, the, the monitoring on the property and reporting to us. Okay. So interest about the, the phases that we're in. We're now in phase one of the reopening. Um, what will be different with phase two and, and when are we looking to begin phase two? Well, that depends on how successful phase one is. I think we've just had the first week and um, we have about another month to go, a month to five weeks. And what we want to do, Lisa, is to really see how successful it has been. If we've opened up our country to uncontrolled risk, then we know that we have to, um, to go back. And, and if we know that uh, you know, our con this is calculated risk and it's workable and our protocols are working, then we can explore uh, maybe laxing uh, the protocols a little bit to uh, up the demand. But it is a gradual opening of our country uh, to incorporate as many businesses as possible so that we can get to a full reopening of our economy eventually. Um, in terms of the, uh, we spoke earlier about what one can expect when they arrive at the Hironor International Airport. Um, we spoke about the first time around, the sort of delays, the four hours of, that it would have taken for someone to have gone through the complete process. What have we done to, um, to sort of amend that, to, to, to remedy that situation? Yeah, so 
The four hours was really what we recorded during the simulation exercise. The first flight that came though, um, we were able to process 130 plus persons in 90 minutes oh. um, at the airport. So the simulation exercise proved very worthy. Very much yes. so. Um, so the, the, the actual uh, first flight that we had, it was an hour, 30 minutes, so 90 minutes uh, um, uh, was what was taken to process 131 persons um, through that medical facility. Um, as the, the, the medical staff becomes uh, familiar with the questionnaire, with the results, with the protocols, with the procedures, we have seen a gradual speed up of that process. Um, and therefore, I, I must report to you that we've seen a, a much quicker time. Um, so we've had two flights back to back. Um, there is a flight that comes in at 2 p.m. and another one at 7 after 2. And we've been able to see this managed uh, quite efficiently. The other thing that um, uh, in the assessments with the entire airport team, and not just the health team, but we talk about immigration, customs, and the, and the parts police, and the entire airport team, is that um, unlike before where you had long lines in immigration, uh, having to wait to, to clear and get your passport stamped, because the wait now is within the medical facility, you find that the numbers are trickling into immigration and to customs. And so the process is a lot quicker. So, so the majority of the time is actually spent in the, current, in, the, in the health facility at the airport and persons has almost a seamless process after. Because by the time you go through immigration, they probably have 10 or 12 persons on that line. You get cleared easily and your bag is, is taken off the convey already by the time you get there. So it's just a matter of picking up your bag and going through customs and being cleared. So we've seen a, a, a process that, that, uh, that is actually reduced in time. Um, so, so more time is spent within the, the public health facility, but going through the other processes is almost seamless and, 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 and uh, very short amount of time is spent in these areas. How much of your, um let me rephrase that. What drives how we are approaching our reopening? And we hear the debate about, well, we wouldn't get a whole, an influx of people coming. Um, some countries have reported that they've seen um, their the visitor arrivals in the thousands already since reopening in the uh, um, 1st of July. So for St. Lucia, are we focused on the numbers coming in? Um, what, what exactly is our goal at this point? I think we're focused on getting it, getting it right so that it does not um, undermine the uh, health and safety of the St. Lucian people, full stop. And, you know, I think if we can do this in a calculated way and the numbers, which is uh, a secondary objective, if that can come in um, at a level where it can lead to a substantial rebound of the economy, then that's fine. But we've always said that this is a pilot phase. This is something we're looking to examine. Uh, we don't know how it is going to work. And what we want to do is to make sure that we do it in little chunks rather than uh, doing it in an entire mountain. We want to take bite sizes so that we can chew it properly. We can look at all the kinks and unravel all of the challenges that we may have. So I am not uh, uh, one to rush into competing with anyone for numbers uh, right now. I think what we want to do is to compete to be the best in terms of our health, our public health situation. And so far, I think that uh, the CMO and Mr. Ragnan and, and, and the Minister of Health and the team, they have done a superb job in ensuring that St. Lucians remain safe and that we recover from the coronavirus. But I think 476 in the first week is not a bad number at all. This is uncounting. And I think that uh, we've added another flight. We didn't have JetBlue for most of the week. And now we're up to uh, somewhere in the region of about uh, 7 and 4, 11 plus 3. So it's 14 flights a week now. So that's going to make a whole lot of difference in terms of the numbers that come in. And uh, we believe that we should see a significant um, capacity coming in a bit later on. But as of now, it is to, to get it right. Yeah, considering that COVID is going to be around 
for a very, very long time, yes. as well as we know it. Uh, Mr. Ragnar, at the um, port, we're looking at the uh, security of the airport personnel. So where are we at with the testing, and how is that process working out? Is it an every day? Um, is it weekly? How do we do the monitoring there? So um, the St. Lucia and Seaports Authority is a partner in that, in that process. And uh, therefore, all staff coming onto the facility on a daily basis is tested. They have employed medical people. They, there is a checkpoint now getting onto the airport um, where you would have to go through uh, the Slasper Sports Police officer. And at that checkpoint, there is also a medical person who is employed. And that is where you are basically screened and assessed. Um, that is something that's happening both for visitors as well as for staff at the airport. Um, so we want our staff to be working in a fairly safe environment at the airport. One of the things that has also escalated is looking at uh, putting barriers, physical barriers. Uh, so the customs office right now there is the, the plexiglass barrier, there's a microphone. It is to reduce direct contact with, with the passengers. The same is happening at the checking points. Um, and uh, the other thing that is happening is uh, for, for guests. So I spoke about SLASPA doing the screening for the staff of the airport. Um, the Ministry of Health now has um, erected a, a thermo scanner at the entry point, that is the checking area, the arrival, um, not the arrival, the departure where you go into check-in. There is a screening station now that every person before they get to the desk to check in has to go through that medical examination and evaluation. So that is what we call um, exit screening. So it's not about screening people coming in, it's about screening people leaving the airport as well. And so these measures are in place, they are being monitored, they are being evaluated uh, uh, to ensure that uh, the people that are leaving St. Lucia is within uh, the, the permitted travel um, protocol at this point in time. So there are different levels for staff as well as for guests at the airports. And so far, um, we've seen it working quite well. Um, there is a little bit of an anxiety, you know, opening up and, and, and that kind of thing. But we need to ensure that we reassure ourselves that the systems are working firstly. And uh, as we've always said, the health, safety and well-being of all staff at the airport is paramount and therefore we need to reduce contact as much as possible. The airport in its own protocols have, have looked at the whole physical distance measure um, and, and uh, that is working quite well at this point in time. And uh, I, I want to say for the first week um, that, that the level of complaints have been very, very few and far in between at the airport facility. We um, had uh, debriefing meetings um, and looking at, you know, areas that we can strengthen and, and, and so forth. And so far there have been very positive feedback by all at the airport in terms of the measures that are implemented to safeguard the health and well-being of staff and visitors alike. The training continues. We know that we've had some training with the uh, taxi operators, the day boat operators as well. You mentioned earlier the villas and the Airbnb. So you'll be doing training with that sector very soon. And we've had the beach vendors as well yes. undergoing training. Car rentals to undergo training and certification. Uh, when are we proposing to have that? Because once that happens, then people, is it an indication that we're fast moving towards the complete reopening? Not necessarily. Um, we have reopened in phases, but we need to be ready. Um, we cannot wait to open a sector and then begin doing the training. And because training is time consuming, um, it also means that uh, one of the things that we found is when we start early, we can actually do what we call the train the trainers. And therefore, because some of these sectors are big. So when you look at a taxi sector, for example, um, there are possibly thousands of, of, of persons in that business. It's make, it makes it very difficult. So if we can train key people of the taxi associations that can then pass on that training and we are there to to, to uh, support this training. So for example, some of the training that was done was done by PAHO um, through uh, Zoom and, and other networks. There have been training that is done by CAFA as well as the Ministry of Health 
and the Ministry of Tourism. We need to, 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 to continue. Training is a continuous process. Uh, um, so, so we are looking at uh, not just the training, but the protocols as well. So we want to ensure that uh, once a green light has been given for that sector to commence, that things are in place and we're not, we're not catching up, so to speak. Um, so that is one of the things that has happened. Um, apart from the training, it has to do with the protocols for each of these different sectors. And the Ministry of Health and Tourism has been working uh, very hard in, in, in developing draft protocols and then meeting with the sectors, the key players in the sectors, to get their take, get their input, so that we can have uh, a, an agreed upon, harmonized protocols that the sector buys into that protocol. We're not developing protocols on our own. Um, it, it would be a futile exercise. We do, we do not have the expertise, nor the experience in several of these areas. And therefore, we need to have all the sectors work and come, come, come on board. There are certain key, key areas um, when we talk about the sanitary measures, the physical distances measures and so forth that we may not compromise on, but there are areas that are very intricate to the business and we need to look at the best mix and the best solution. So we've been working with all the sectors in terms of ensuring that the protocols are their protocols and not our protocols and that they can be implemented. All right, so it's not a situation where a visitor now can just simply say, let me go rent a car in the next month, just because we've announced that we'll be having training for the car rental sector. Yes, so that has been made clear. Minister, in terms of the figures, when we look at the government's response to COVID-19 and the um, provision of the quarantine facilities and, and the, all of the supporting um, activity that goes along with that, how much money has been spent on the direct COVID response from the government? Well, the number I saw for the Ministry of Health alone was $31 million. I know that um, there were a lot of other monies to go into the social um, revitalization program, the economic uh, stimulus program as well, um, would have attracted several millions. Uh, there was $24 million to the, um, the income support program, which targets the unemployed um, individuals within the informal sector and when you look at what NIC is doing it's ranging from anywhere between 31 to 80 million uh, so when you add up the numbers it's it's a significant chunk of money that the government would have had to find looking at the national feeding program the Ministry of Agriculture as well um, had some allocation to support the local farmers and you know it has been a significant uh, uh, draining of the resources of government, if you will. Mm -hmm. But it's been a, a rather difficult uh, situation to manage both economically, uh, emotionally, and psychologically. It has caused the cabinet and um, other leaders in the civil service a lot of sleepless nights and a lot of work to ensure that we respond to this adequately. It has not been um, an easy uh, feat. You would have heard the Minister of Finance and Prime Minister indicated that um, the revenue in government went from 110 mm. to 50 million, I think, average. Uh, I hope that they're doing a little better than that now, but uh, it's been uh, a rather, rather um, difficult task in making sure uh, that, that all of this is done. I want to say thank you so much, but before we close off, parting words, Mr. Ragnanan. I just want to continue to encourage every single one um, that COVID is a reality. What I've seen is uh, there's a tendency to let down the guard too soon. And um, I want to appeal to all St. Lucian to continue to be on heightened alert and take uh, the precautionary measures to protect in yourself and your families. Um, St. Lucia has opened the borders. I know that uh, um, some of the measures are difficult. I, I find it difficult to wear a mask all the time. Um, something I've had to do over the last four or five months. I'm getting used to it now, but even then it's a challenge. But these are important measures and we need to, to be on our guard at all times. To, to observe in the basic, what we call the basic protocols, the basic measures to safeguard in ourselves and the health of our family. Um, we as, as a country are looking at the whole opening of the borders. Uh, as a matter of fact, just before coming here this morning, 
I had a meeting and a walkthrough at the George F. L. Charles, Charles Airport because we are looking at um, the regional travel and reopening that airport in itself and looking at what it is that we can put in place in terms of ensuring safety of all. We are slowly reopening the borders. I mean, the seaports, for example, we are open to yachts at this point in time. Um, there's a, a, a big appeal to looking at um, the ferries and, and, and later down in the year, the, the cruise ship. Um, but we need to continue to take very small steps, baby steps, and to constantly evaluate, assess, and uh, to be ready to make adjustments as deemed necessary. And we would continue to work with all partners in ensuring that we do so in a very responsible way. Yes, sir. Yeah, well, I just want to say that um, we've just presided over a very successful seven days of our reopening. Um, some 500 uh, tourists, we've been able to repatriate hundreds of our nationals who have come in and who have been put on the managed quarantine situations. Uh, we have been able to return some 1,400 hotel employees back to work, 500 taxi drivers, and uh, dozens others in the um, indirect sector, uh, companies that trade with tourism. So I think all in all, it's been a good week for the recovery of the economy. And when we weighed against the risk so far, all we know is that there has been one positive case but that case was in a quarantine facility, so there was very little chance of there being a community spread as a result of it. We continue to work in the best interest of the people of St. Lucia, testing all of uh, the uh, people that are coming in from risk areas. We are working with hotels to ensure that their protocols are well managed as well, and we continue to manage our quarantine facilities to the extent where uh, we would have to stagger the return of the influx of returning nationals, especially those coming from high-risk areas. And all in all, St. Lucia continues to do very well. St. Lucia continues to have a resounding success in the management of its COVID response. All right. Thank you so much, there, Mr. The uh, Chief uh, Environmental Officer within the Ministry of Health with Parker Ragnanan and Minister for Tourism, Information, Broadcasting and Culture and Creative Industries, Honorable Dominic Fede. Just to, to uh, re-emphasize for you, since the opening from July 9 to uh, July 16, we've had 170 individuals who are under home quarantine. Those who are quarantined at the government facilities, we have 254. And the COVID certified hotels, we have 476. And airport swabs, meaning people who were tested right there at the airport for one reason or another, that number is 20. So it looks like we are off to a very good start and continuing to remain safe as we do so. Want to thank you so much. We hope that the information has been very valuable to you. Pass it on. I am Mr. Joseph signing off from the Information Command Center. Until next time.